It's Wednesday, January 17. In the headlines, the Domestic Violence Amendment Act 2023 to come into effect January 22. Government to spend 87 million US dollars on Spanish Town Hospital. In business news, Jamaica's Consumer Confidence Index will take a look at that. Regionally, Cayman Islands disaster agencies collaborate with neighbors. And in sports, WADA increases regional monetary support. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gill. The government plans to spend 87 million US dollars to redevelop Spanish Town Hospital. This is in addition to funds granted from the European Union. Speaking at the groundbreaking ceremony on Tuesday, Prime Minister Andrew Honus credited the government's ability to fund the project to good fiscal management. Prime Minister Andrew Holness explained that by employing practical fiscal management skills over the years, the government can now deliver major upgrades and renovations to hospitals and clinics across the island. We have been able to reduce our debt, reduce our debt servicing, so that we have more money to spend on the things that matter to you. Today is a perfect example of what a good economy delivers for its citizens. He says, while Jamaicans are rightly frustrated with the island's health system and its paucity of equipment, they should bear in mind the availability of resources to correct that over the years. But this government has managed your fiscal affairs, your revenues, the taxes that you pay, whether it is GCT, property tax, whatever tax, we have managed it in such a way that today, from our budget, we can say we will allocate 87 million US dollars from our budget. When completed, the new hospital will boast a six-story facility comprising several operating theaters, a new accident and emergency center, a new pharmacy and laboratory with diagnostics and other support services. Mr. Holness says as the economy's resilience improves, the increases in output will be spent on healthcare along with other critical sectors such as education, sanitation, elderly care and public transportation. If you want more hospitals, you want better roads, we have to produce more. Our personal productivity has to improve. And when that is paired with good government that manages that within an economy, it generates the revenues. The Domestic Violence Amendment Act 2023 has been given the nod by His Excellency, the Governor General Sir Patrick Allen. In making the announcement to the House of Representatives on Tuesday, Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, Olivia Grange, says a new day has come for protecting victims and increasing the punishment for perpetrators of domestic abuse. This government, and indeed the whole House, has demonstrated its commitment to preventing and punishing acts of domestic violence through the passage of these important amendments, which will, among other things, allow the court to issue protection orders and impose a penalty of up to $1 million for breach of a protection order, and up from a maximum of $10,000 and a sentence of up to one year in prison. The protection orders are intended to guard against potential harm. From harassment to property damage. And it is right with the passage of time that we now apply a more appropriate penalty that will serve as a deterrent to this very serious crime. The new law, Madam Speaker, will also increase the categories of persons who can make an application for a protection order including the spouse or parent of an individual in respect of whom the conduct has been made 
or is likely to be made. Under the new law, the children advocate will also now be able to apply for a protection order where the alleged conduct is threatened against a child. Domestic abuse is not inevitable. It doesn't have to happen. There is no excuse for abuse. And we can end the abuse. The amendment of our legislation is part of our effort to end the abuse. Minister Grange says the new law will come into effect on Monday, January 22, 2024. Meanwhile, Minister Grange reiterated the intention of the deliberations of the Joint Select Committee that will review the Domestic Violence Act towards strengthening the protection of victims and dealing appropriately with perpetrators. Tuition fees for some courses at the University of the West Indies Mona campus will likely increase in the upcoming academic year as part of a program to earn more than $1.5 billion for the institution. Danita Rodney reports. The University of the West Indies Mona campus has announced that in its vision to achieve financial sustainability, it is likely to increase tuition fees for some courses. Speaking at the Institute's first press conference for the new year, Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Denzel Williams revealed ambitious plans to cut costs and grow revenue over the short and medium term. He is quoted saying, We are restructuring our business processes and organizational design to derive greater levels of efficiency and streamline our revenue generating areas of the campus under the aegis of a transformational project operation RTG, Restructuring Transformation and Growth, end quote. While reviewing the cost of all programs for the 2024-25 academic year, Professor Williams assured that the university would adopt an appropriate pricing mechanism to remain competitive. Reporting for the news on PBCJ, I'm Denita Rodney. Representatives of Sandals, the Jamaica Tourist Board, as well as other local stakeholders are participating in what has been dubbed Broadcast Paradise between January 13 to January 21. 43 radio stations from key markets across the United States are currently in the island participating in the event, reaching millions of listeners and giving Jamaica's tourism a massive boost. It is being held at Sandals Duns River Resort, Mami Bay in St. Anne. Senior strategist and senior advisor in the Ministry of Tourism, Delano Sievright, says these live broadcasts will be in some of Jamaica's key areas of connectivity like Miami, Denver and Philadelphia will amplify the island's tourism offerings. Mr. Sivright says the event will also include live interviews with key tourism stakeholders such as Duns River Falls and Park, Scotch's Jerk, Miss T's Restaurant, Worthy Park Estates, Pure Chocolate Jamaica, Chocolate Caribbean Adventures, Devon House, Kingston Creative Art Walk, and Bob Marley Museum. Consumer confidence returning to pre-pandemic conditions? We'll hear more about this from Denise Williams in the Business Report. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the Business Report. I'm Denise Williams, your guide through the latest happenings in the world of business. In investment news, Jamaica's Consumer Confidence Index suggests that consumers are sensing a return to pre-pandemic conditions with expectations of significant changes in business and job conditions over the next 12 months, according to Don Anderson, CEO of Market and Research Services. These findings were disclosed during the virtual release of the Jamaica Conference Board's fourth quarter 2023 Indices of Business and Consumer Confidence themed Bears vs. Bulls, preparing for what's ahead on Tuesday. Despite the diverging trajectories of confidence, businesses and consumers remain steadfast in their concern about crime and violence considering it a significant impediment to Jamaica's growth. 
The survey revealed that 70% of consumers in the fourth quarter identified crime and violence as the major critical issue, a 12% increase from the previous quarter. Similarly, 55% of businesses shared the same view, marking a 12% increase. Portland JSX Limited for the nine months ended November 30, 2023, reported a net loss on financial assets bought for a value of US $8.14 million, now valued at US $613,000, or a 92% drop in value. Overall, net loss for the nine months ended November 30, 2023, increased to US $8.98 million, compared to the 2022 return of US $1.35 million. For the quarter, net loss totaled US $264,000, which is an improvement over the 2022 experience, where the net loss was US $1.73 million. Sibony Group, for the six months ended November 30, 2023, recorded no revenue relative to the $1,000 reported for the prior financial year. No revenue was recorded for the quarter relative to total revenue of $1,000 a year prior. On November 15th, the company announced its intention in a resolution to shareholders at the annual general meeting on December 6, 2023, to change the company's name from Sibony Group Limited to Innovative Energy Group Limited. This resolution was passed by the shareholders at the meeting, and for the purposes of this report, Sibony Group Limited will be referred to by its new name, Innovative Energy Group Limited. As a result, Sibony Group Limited reports six months net loss of 3.36 million. Cygnus Real Estate Finance Limited for the first quarter ended November 30, 2023, reported a 42% decrease in interest income totaling $43.83 million compared to $74.93 million in the corresponding three months last year. Operating loss for the three months was $132.68 million, a 23% decrease relative to the loss of $172.64 million reported in 2022. Loss before taxation for the first quarter ended November 30, 2023, amounted to $132.98 million, a 23% decrease relative to the loss of $172.5 million in 2022. There were no taxation charges for the three months, and for 2022, there were no other taxation. AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited for the first quarter ended November 30, 2023, reported a 7% increase in revenue, totaling $272.49 million, compared to $254.27 million in the corresponding three months last year. Total expenses for the first quarter amounted to $50.5 million, a 13% increase relative to the $44.10 million reported in 2022. This was largely due to administrative expenses, which increased by 21% to close at $32.31 million, compared to 2022, where the results were $26.63 million, followed by depreciation, which increased by 26% from $10.16 million in 2022 to $12.82 million for the three-month period. Net profit for the three months amounted to $39.86 million, a 64% increase from the $24.34 million reported in 2022. We now look at the stock markets. During trading on January 16, 2024, the top advancing stocks covered real estate, finance, and food sectors on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. 138 student live in Jamaica, variable preference shares, advanced 26.5% to jump by $35.04 to close at $162.27 with four shares traded. First Rock Capital Holdings Limited 
JMD shares advanced by 18.97% to go up in price by $1.25 to close at $7.84 with 16,755 shares traded. Consolidated Bakeries, Jamaica Limited, which trades as Purity, saw its shares advance by 15.96%, or climb by 30 cents, to close at $2.18, with 1,000 shares traded. On the declining stocks that traders experienced on January 16, 2024, the top three losers covered the distribution tourism and insurance sectors. AMG Packaging and Paper Company declined by 17.61% to slide by 53 cents to close at $2.48 with 131,000 shares traded. Margaritaville Turks Limited declined by 12.83% to close at 10 cents with 3,390 shares traded. General Accident Insurance company Jamaica Limited declined by 12.15% for a loss of value by 65 cents to close at $4.70 with 3,900 shares traded. Over to the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, trading activity on the first tier market registered a volume of 106,000 shares, crossing the floor of the exchange valued at 3.7 million TT dollars. First Caribbean International Bank Limited was the volume leader with 51,000 shares, changing hands for a value of 358,000 Trinidad dollars, followed by First Citizens Group Financial Holdings Limited with a volume of 32,400 shares being traded for 1.6 million Trinidad dollars. Calypso Macro Index Fund was the only active security on the mutual fund market posing a volume of 80 shares valued at 1,800 Trinidad dollars. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives, and companies on the regional stock markets, we turn to the Forex market. On January 16, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that US 34.6 million was bought from Forex traders, while US 20.1 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, Foreign currency traders sold the US dollar for $156.02 and bought the US dollar for $154.78. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.24, which represents a profit for Forex traders for every US dollar traded. Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $5.40 from transactions with the Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $5.40 from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $118.14 and bought for $112.74. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $6.99, selling it for $202.32 and buying it for $195.33. For our credit report tip of the day, we encourage you to get a free copy of your credit report and read it. Why bother reading your credit report? Well, number one, you want to spot errors. Mistakes happen and they can be costly. From inaccurate personal information to erroneous account details, identifying errors is the first step towards fixing them. Two, protect your score. Your credit score is a powerful asset. Unnoticed errors could be dragging it down, affecting your ability to secure loans or favorable interest rates. Three, guard against fraud. Your credit report is a frontline defense against identity theft. Regular checkups help you catch any suspicious activity before it spirals out of control. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams. I appreciate your company, Stay well informed, stay ahead of the curve. Until our next update, take care. In regional news, a group of representatives from Jamaica, the Bahamas, and the Dominican Republic are in the Cayman Islands this week to meet with several of the country's disaster agencies. More from CIG News.
Brigade Commander of Maritime Air and Cyber Command within the Jamaica Defense Force, tells us they have recognized after their annual national exercise that greater collaboration and coordination with neighboring partners such as the Cayman Islands is necessary. What started off as an exercise that was Jamaica focused only has now morphed into a multinational exercise where for this serial we have roughly six countries um, participating. Um, it actually had to come down from, from 11 when we originally started, started the planning. Um, the focus of the exercise is, as I mentioned, to build collaboration and coordination within our partners, partners that we believe that if there is a significant event, whether it be natural or man-made, we would have to work with, 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 each, each, with each other. We've started our interaction working or interacting with the, the Cayman Islands Regiment and the Cayman Islands Coast Guard and the Hazard, Hazard Management. Um, and we have equivalent within the within the Jamaican infrastructure, and I am very pleased with the efforts that I that I see here, um, and also the interoperability. I was, in fact, I wasn't even aware how much our Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management works closely uh, with your hazard hazard management team. So to see that uh, is very encouraging. On the military side, we side we have a very good working relationship, um, primarily with the Coast Guard. Of course, the regiment is new, and um, what we're looking to build those capacity and build those interaction and work together going forward. So we have 19 shelters. Yes. The now the overall idea is to practice, train and work together if a major disaster happens so they can work together seamlessly. Danielle Coleman, Director of Hazard Management Cayman Islands, explains what it all means for all involved. It's basically making sure that the Jamaica and this team can help us after, in the aftermath of any emergency. So for example, we had a large scale earthquake uh, and we'd need uh, surge capacity from overseas. Um, this team is it's basically ideal for that. So they'll come and help us with either relief supplies, it might be other expertise on the ground, be engineering and so forth. So it really is critical that we have these kind of arrangements with our neighbors in the region. Uh, we work very closely with the overseas territories, but of course, if something happens to one of our communities or our, our, our neighboring countries, we have to be able to support each other. The HMCI director went on to say in case of a disaster, we will in fact need help from our partners who all play a fundamental part of the response. Included are the United Kingdom, Sedema, neighboring countries and other overseas territories who we have assisted after disasters in their area in the past. A cybersecurity expert expects more businesses in Barbados and in the region will gravitate towards investing in cybersecurity this year due to fears of online breaches. Neil Harper says there were several high profile breaches in the Caribbean last year and in 2022, targeting not only banking but electricity providers. We continue to see these type of breaches largely because of the investment in cybersecurity at uh, businesses. And it's not because businesses necessarily uh, can't afford it, but especially for large businesses, but it's in the it's in the 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 context of where is the, where are their investments being that are directed? And does management understand that cyber risk is not just a technology risk, but it's a business risk. Seeing a number of governments across the region investing in cyber capacity building. You see, the government of, of Barbados has has had cyber nations. Um, there was the first um, um cohort where there were <clears throat> almost a hundred persons went tr went through the cyber nations uh, training and have, uh, and are now being um a lot. A number of them are being employed out, outside of Barbados, supporting um, cyber resilience, but they, they are also being employed in Barbados as well. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, has highlighted bilateral talks with Saudi Arabia and Venezuela as part of the country's plans to enhance gas security and more sustainable future. According to Statista, Venezuela has the greatest share of global oil reserves at over 19%, followed by Saudi Arabia at 17%. Interestingly, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley indicates this country has been in talks with both energy giants. Recently, Trinidad and Tobago participated in the inaugural CARICOM Saudi Arabia Summit, where at both the bilateral and multilateral channels, 
We discussed areas of cooperation and investment in energy, as well as in agriculture and food security, renewable energy, climate change, finance and tourism. In their joint statement issued after the summit, the Caribbean community and Saudi Arabia agreed to boost their trade and investment flows. With regard to Venezuela, Dr. Rowley highlights TNT's most recent negotiation success, a 30-year exploration and exploitation license with the Bolivarian Republic to develop the Dragon Field. Export gas to Trinidad and Tobago for re-export as manufactured uh, petrochemicals and LNG. This project is expected to yield an output of 350 million cubic feet of gas, natural gas per day for the production of these products I've just mentioned. This will provide a significant buffer and strengthening to our economy and allow us to plan for the future based on a predictable supply of natural gas. Describing it as a watershed pioneering agreement, the Prime Minister says the contract provides available resources for TNT and opens up international markets for Venezuela. To further commercialize our energy resources, the government has recently secured a new unitized commercial structure for Atlantic LNG, which allows the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, the NGC, to obtain a greater share in the revenue derived from the sale of LNG on the global market. Dr. Rowley outlines the importance of this restructured agreement for the country. This unprecedented agreement will provide for the long-term sustainability of Trinidad and Tobago's gas sector and, as with the Dragonfield, Dragonfield deal, ensure greater certainty for the investment future. In sports, President of World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, Withhold Banker, says the agency will increase its financial support for the region to $35 million, representing a 50% increase. He says it's an indication of the organization's commitment to the region's fight against doping in sports. He was speaking at a two-day forum, which began on Monday at Jamaica Conference Center. The forum was attended by representatives from eight countries, including Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, the Bahamas, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Lucia. Discussions focused on several issues, including providing an update on the anti-doping landscape in the Caribbean and the crucial role played by governments in clean sport. Eight regional ministers represented also signed the Kingston Declaration, which Sports Minister Babsy Grange deemed as vital. Several of the West Indies top players opted out of the Test Series for more lucrative engagements in T20 and T10 leagues. The Windies captain offered suggestions on what could curb this trend. We're going to get many Test matches, that's one. So more Test matches you know, would, would be great for us. Uh, obviously last year we only had pretty much six games. I think if we get more, uh, we play more cricket, and I think, I think it, that, would, that would help a lot. Um, and obviously incentifying test cricket is always, is always great because, you know, T20 cricket is out there, T10 cricket is out there, so it will always be tough. But, you know, I believe the more cricket we play, the better. And also for aspiring youngsters in the Caribbean, you know, if we play test cricket and, and we as West Indians do well, they grow up seeing it and, and that will help them inspire to want to play for West Indians. But if they don't see it, then they will inspire to want to play what they see, which is, you know, the T20s, T10s around the world. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. Remember, we are the People's Station.